You're watching a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. South Dakota history is full of wonderful stories, horrible events, colorful cultures, hard work, great courage, important decisions, remarkable people. And yet, when people talk of South Dakota history, they often mention quirky people who didn't contribute much to the state or events so odd that it's hard to imagine how they could have anything to do with us. It's tempting to say, let's forget these strange folks, and instead look only at history we know to be important to South Dakota's development. But there's a problem with that. These people and their stories refuse to go away. They're unforgettable, and that probably says more about us than it does about them. They are part of South Dakota. Their legends, characters, and stories handed down through time, hard or impossible to prove true or untrue. After a hard day, lots of us like to stop thinking about our worries and escape into the pages of a book or into the lives of characters on TV. <laughs> Don't be scared, Charlie. <laughs> People have always allowed themselves to be carried away by stories. Imagine instead of settling before a TV, gathering around a campfire and listening to a storyteller. Some stories told that way were so important to listeners that they were repeated over and over, long before people knew writing. A lake near Wa Bay owes its name to one of those stories. Long ago, according to legend, some Dakota women and children were out gathering wild turnips called Teepsina and they were on a high hill located west of Sicha Hollow on the northeast part of present-day South Dakota. A young boy who was blessed with good eyesight spotted some enemy warriors dressed up like wolves and hiding in the grass. He told his grandmother and the others, but only grandmother believed him. She and her grandson slipped away as darkness fell and went back to Sicha Hollow to tell the warriors of the tribe what they had seen. When the Dakota warriors traveled to the high hill, known today as Weah Paha, or Women's Hill, they came upon the women and children and found they had been slain by their enemy. The young men tracked their enemy for many miles to this lake and attacked them. The enemy had to swim for their lives across the lake, but it did them no good for the Dakota warriors were on the other shore as well and were waiting for them. The brave young men had their revenge for the killing of the women and children, and all of the enemy were killed there on the waters of the lake. To this day, the water is known as Enemy Swim Lake. Whether the events here happened exactly as remembered will never be known. Yet, it's easy to understand how the story was loved by its first listeners, who could celebrate their people's victory over the enemy, admire their own warrior's skill at tracking, and laugh at their enemy's frantic swimming. There were also wild, funny tales told around campfires, stories everyone knew were made of. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be with you when we run up against a bunch of Indians. I'll be dead. No better than you shoot. I'm figuring on it. They'll, they'll lift your hair. I can tell you, they wouldn't get much. <laughs> the adventures of Paul Bunyan, the giant lumberjack who in stories strode across South Dakota to create the Black Hills, are those kinds of tales. But just as often, storytellers told their audiences about real people who started sounding like giants in their own ways. Take Hugh Glass. The lonely plains along the Grand River in northwestern South Dakota look much as they did in 1823 when Glass was part of a fur trapping group traveling the river. A grizzly bear attacked Glass. Glass's companions looked at his terrible injuries and either believed he was dead or would be soon. They took his gun and other belongings and left him. But Glass survived, 
Crawling 190 miles across these rugged lands, he ate berries and other plant life and hid under branches and leaves so wolves and other wild animals wouldn't find him. He finally dragged himself into Fort Kiowa on the Missouri River. Glass's story has been told in a best-selling book, a poem, and in movies. But before that, his adventure was one of the most popular campfire tales in the West, as gold seekers made their way to California and as settlers followed the Oregon Trail in the 1840s and 1850s. It's easy to understand why. Those listeners found themselves in lonely lands too, full of dangers. If Hugh Glass could survive, they told themselves, so would they. Paul Bunyan was made up. Hugh Glass was real, although storytellers probably added to his tale to make it more entertaining. And then there are other well-known South Dakota characters whose stories fall somewhere between the fiction of Paul Bunyan and the reality of Hugh Glass. Maybe these people lived, and maybe they didn't. For example, did a real-life giant once roam the countryside around Gettysburg? Early South Dakotans talked excitedly about the prayer rock, which appeared to show giant human footprints and a handprint. Or was the prayer rock a hoax, an elaborate story with evidence made up by someone who wanted to get folks stirred up? The possibility of a hoax was also raised in Spearfish, where another rock was found by Lewis Thone, a stonecutter. Scratched into the slab, which came to be named the Thone Stone, were these words. Came to these hills in 1833, seven of us, De La Camp, Ezra The stone lists seven gold prospectors who supposedly came to the area 40 years before the Black Hills Gold Rush of the 1870s. All dead but me, Ezra Kind killed by Indians behind the high hill, got our gold, June 1834. We got all of the gold we could carry, our ponies all got by the Indians. I've lost my gun and nothing to eat, and Indians hunting me. Is the Thone Stone a record of seven adventurers who, unlike Hugh Glass, didn't survive? Or is it a hoax? Black Hills historians have wondered for more than 100 years. There's a place northeast of Sioux Falls, near the little town of Gerritsen, where you can judge for yourself whether a legend is true or hoax. The man in question is Jesse James, a bank robber, train robber, and killer, who was one of the most famous American criminals ever. But criminal or not, he's a beloved legend to many, celebrated in book and song. Jesse James was a lad, he killed many a man. He robbed the Glendale train. He stole from the rich and he gave to the poor. He's a hand out of heart and a brain. Yes, he had a wife to mourn all her life. Three children that all were brave. In September 1876, Jesse James, his brother Frank, and their gang tried to rob a bank in Northfield, Minnesota. But the people of Northfield shot two of the gang dead and drove the others away, some with wounds. Years later, Frank James recalled, Jesse and me were well beaten and we laid up in Dakota Territory for several days. The brothers entered Dakota Territory September 17th. According to legend, Jesse James was chased north of Sioux Falls on horseback. And the story goes, James would have been captured in Dakota Territory if he hadn't jumped his horse 20 feet over this chasm high above Split Rock Creek. While visitors look at the chasm today and wonder whether the legend is true, a more important question might be, why are we fascinated by characters like Jesse James or gunslingers like Wild Bill Hickok in the first place? I believe people are very interested in loners and romantic characters. Wild Bill was uh, very handsome, he was tall, he, he was different, um, and he personified the uh, free-spirited uh, American hero, um, and so I, I believe that people um, saw him as very different from themselves and someone that they could get lost in. Um, he was an entertaining character and, um, and larger than life. Mary Kopko is director of the Adams Museum in Deadwood. 
As much as any town in the nation, Deadwood is famous for legendary characters who lived bizarre lives, drank too much, sometimes broke the law, and didn't really do much for Deadwood's improvement. Visitors especially like hearing about hard-drinking, cussing Calamity Jane and gunslinger Wild Bill Hickok, who was shot down in Deadwood after living there only a few weeks. People visit Calamity Jane and Wild Bill's graves, admire statues of them, and even watch a reenactment of Wild Bill's murder. Carl, Carl. 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 Say, Charlie, could we trade places? Sorry, Bill, my cards are pretty hot right now. You know I don't like to sit my back to the door. Let's, let's trade places. No way, Bill, I'm on a good run right now. All right, all right. Deal them out, gentlemen, deal them out. I hope you're ready to lose money, I'm ready to win. Give you some more money, though. Say, Harry, any chance of borrowing about $15 from you? Oh, I'm putting it on my tab. You know I'm good for it. Oh, excellent. Thank you kindly. Appreciate that very much. Appreciate it. Oh, there, hold there! Hey, Bill. Oh, yeah. Howdy, Jack. Looking for a card game, huh? Maybe. Yeah, looks like you've been drinking a bit. Okay. Let's get back to the game here, gentlemen. I can go one more here. Yeah, all right. How many do you need, sir? Okay. In the 19th century, Wild Bill was uh, a character in a dime novel, and uh, now today, of course, he comes on the silver screen. These characters, well, characters, they're not, uh, I mean, they were real people who took on a whole persona. These characters are interesting and they fascinate uh, the imagination and I think that that leads people to start doing research. Research inspired by these characters usually uncovers lesser known people and stories that should not be forgotten. When exploring South Dakota's past, it's important to try to decide what definitely happened, what maybe happened, and what definitely did not happen. Considering all those types of stories helps us understand who we were and who we are today. It maybe also tells us who we'd like to be, what scares us, and maybe even what we're scared of being. For additional information, a teacher's guide, games, quizzes, and more, log on to dakotapathways.org.